welcome to Insight. Today we are chatting with Todd Benson, Chair of the Board of WildAid. Todd Benson is the founder and CEO of one of the largest venture capital funds in Europe and is currently dedicating substantial time to strengthening WildAid. WildAid focuses on ending the illegal trade in wildlife products by encouraging consumers to reduce their demand for those products, particularly in China and throughout South Asia. They also run a number of conservation projects. Todd has generously agreed to share some of his experience with us, and I'd like to thank you, Todd, for taking the time to join us today. Sure. I found a lot of resonance in, in your work as a um, venture capitalist and your work as a board member of this nonprofit. Could you speak a little bit about how those two experiences sure. uh, interact? What I've found is that, and it's not just with Wild Aid, as I've been involved with some other charities before, is that there are a lot of similarities between backing a company in your venture capital portfolio and backing a small charity. Importantly, their reward is different. I mean, a lot of the great tech companies have been founded by people working at a big tech company who saw that there was a problem out there which their company was too big to address and other companies weren't addressing. And so they split out and they typically take on a lot of risk and take a pay cut and have to then recruit other passionate people and the great hope is usually that you get fabulously wealthy. And sometimes you change the world if you're very lucky as a tech company. Well, in the, in the charity arena, it's, it's similar, except your reward is mostly about changing the world. Right. The conclusion which the founders of Wild Aid came to is that the illegal animal trade shares characteristics with the other four big illegal trades, which are the arms trade, the drug trade, and the human trade, in that they're demand-driven. Nobody goes out and kills an animal or takes drugs across a border or you know, buys guns for the fun of it. They Unless do, there's a market for they it. They do it because they can make a lot of money. And if the demand is there, then the bad people and the poor people will meet it. There are a few charities out there which look at the trafficking in, in these areas. But what Peter Knights and Steve Trent decided to do was to focus Wild Aid on trying to convince consumers not to want to consume these products. And when you look at endangered animal products, they broadly fall into three categories. You have ones which are thought to be medicinal, ones which are thought to be aphrodisiacs, and ones which are served as or displayed as a sign of affluence. And sometimes the demand is very widespread, sometimes it's very focused. And what we try and do is to educate people as to why you should respect these animals uh, for me, the simple argument that it's not man's right to make another species extinct is, would be sufficient, but for a lot of people, they, they need more than that. Once you have informed them of that, some people will make the right decision, but above and beyond that, we need to make it uncool to consume these things and sway public opinion over to where either you don't do it because you think it's wrong or you don't do it because other people will think that you're doing the wrong thing. So you have the intellectual argument on the one hand, and you have the argument of passion on the other, the, the, the argument of, uh, of the heart, of peer pressure, of image. Sure, so if you take our biggest current focus, which is on sharks, there's about 400 species of sharks, about 90 of which are threatened, including most of the major ones which people would know about, but there's only three which are listed on CITES. But you can lay out the arguments to, say, the Chinese market, which is the main consumer of sharks, there's 100 million sharks being killed every year. About two-thirds are killed just for their fins to make shark fin soup in China, which is extraordinary. So the sharks are, are basically captured, their fins are cut off, and then they're, that's, and that's the, bodies the problem. Are thrown the back, bodies are just thrown back Often in. still alive, but soon to die into the ocean because they're caught by people who can't make money by keeping the shark on the, on the ship and then selling it because there's not a big market for shark meat, but can make a huge amount of money by t taking the fins, drying them, and selling them on. So the campaign, for instance, on sharks says to the, the Chinese market through our celebrities, and we'll talk about how we do this, did you realize that there's 100 million sharks being killed each year? Did you realize that they're endangered? Do you realize they are the effective apex predator in the oceans right now? It'll be very bad for the oceans if they were to be wiped out. Additionally, do you realize that sharks are uh, loaded with mercury because they eat the mercury up the food chain 
And with some people, particularly older people, that's the most effective thing. It's, it's interesting what pulls at people's heartstrings. We don't copy the anti-fur movement, uh, but it's interesting with the anti-fur movement, that is succeeded simply by saying it's cruel. Right. In respect of you know, an animal which is otherwise farmed to be consumed by humans, much like you know, cows and chickens. And so with wildlife, there tends to be a more compelling argument that man has overpopulated the planet. There are now billions of us. It's already so late in the game that you don't have all of the arguments for saving them. So for instance, tigers, which happens to be our second biggest focus this year because it's the year of the tiger and there's a big problem with Chinese tiger farms. Where there's approximately 5,000 tigers which have been bred in captivity and the owners of those farms are lobbying the Chinese government to re-allow domestic trade. International trade in tiger parts is banned um, by CITES. But were that to happen, then the demand would increase. That supply would be used up, and then they would go after the wild ones because it's cheaper to poach a wild animal than it is to raise one in captivity. So there's very complex arguments which go species by species. And we ought to work with species-specific supply-side charities to see if we can jointly fundraise or jointly do campaigns. You go straight to the demand, and you're basically going to try and collapse the market for, for these products. And if you can eliminate the market for the products, then the supply side takes care of itself. There's no more profit in it. It seems to be counter, counterintuitive. If you hit the suppliers, it's very few actors in this whole economic ecosystem. But when you talk about consumers, you're talking about millions and millions and millions of people it widely dispersed. So how do, you, how do you change that logic where costs would seem to be higher to attack the consumer side? Well, all credit to, to Pete Steve, who founded the thing. They've been in the field doing brave work, you know, finding poachers and uncovering illegal bird shops and things like that, but became very frustrated by the fact that even when you had proof that this was happening, not much happened about it. I mean, it's quite easy sitting in America to think, yeah, we ought to care most about animal rights. You know, in some of these other places, you know, it just never gets to the top of the pile. Right. They looked at the world's best companies and thought if you can use advertising to make people buy something, you should be able to use advertising to make people not buy something. You, the trick was you had to get credible spokesmen who people paid attention to and then also get the media distribution. And having decided that using celebrities was the right way to go about this, at first, it was difficult, and Jackie Chan was the first person to be convinced to do it. And we wanted people who were credible out in Asia, one, because of their popularity, but also because we happen to be a US-based charity. But Asia and the rest of the third world has had quite enough about being lectured by America on how they ought to be living their lives. And it's much more effective if you can give them a, a native message. Really, we focus on actors and athletes and Yao Ming is now probably our number one spokesman in China, particularly on sharks. Jackie's focusing a little bit more on tigers. Yeah, but Yao's the most recognized human being in China. If you held up a photo of him and a photo of the president, yeah, yeah they'd, <laughs> they'd point to Yao. So we've got almost 100 of these celebrities donating their time to do this, which is fabulous. But then still, you've got to get it out. And the team has been incredibly effective in brokering deals with the media agencies out there. And in fact, we have a deal with CCTV where we're shown prime time across China on multiple channels. Similar deal in India with Doordashan. We just signed a deal with Xinhua, the Chinese news agency. And we're the first foreign organization, charitable or for-profit, to have a formal deal with Xinhua, which produces the national newspapers and also the briefings for the government mm -hmm. officials. So the value of the donated media time which we're getting is approaching a hundred million dollars a year and we can actually say that in most weeks we're reaching a billion people with our messages. So to deconstruct this though you have multiple types of donations. You have uh, you started off with the celebrities who are giving of their time um, and sometimes substantial time to shoot these spots. Then you have the media organizations that are actually doing the, the shooting. That's donated as well very often, is it not? The way it breaks down is that the celebs donate their time, the ad agencies donate their time to do the creative, the media distribution is for the most part donated. We've never paid for any TV spots. 
the things we have to pay for are salaries, rents for offices, and production of the PSAs. So on that side, our income is currently about $2 million a year. And there's a lot of you know, animal charities who would love to have an income of $2 million a year. But for someone with our ambition and our scope of operations and having this huge distribution network, it's a frustration that we can't do more and produce more. And so the, the mission of the board is to make us a much bigger organization on the income side in order to make us a, a larger staffed organization so that we don't have to say, well, this year are we going to do tigers or are we going to do rhinos? We can address whatever problem is there. And I, I firmly believe that's possible. That's why I've dedicated so much time to this, but it's, it's a work in progress. And the issue we face is that about 97% of the money donated in America to charities does not go to animal charities. And terrific. I mean, there's lots of other great causes. Of the 3%, 2% goes to cats and dogs. And that's extremely understandable. You know, I have dogs and give to a dog charity. Of the 1%, the majority goes to domestic wild animals. And so you're already at a very small piece of it. And you have to be realistic about that in terms of how you're building your strategy. You then find that a lot of the foundations which are focused on animal conservation have been set up by people who are scientists or succeeded in the tech world, and they've hired scientists and to administer that, and they're most comfortable funding scientists doing the research. And when we come out and say, well, we've got this sort of businessy media model, which is actually <laughs> terribly important, you just don't drop into any of their funding silos. Right, coming, coming out of the advertising world. But each dollar is leveraging many, many dollars on the other side. Of bang for a your bang buck. <laughs> for, for, that, for that small buck. It, it's true. And, and we stack up incredibly well on things like fundraising expenses and efficiency ratios. And also have the attraction that because we're so small, if someone were to give us half a million or a million dollars in a particular year, that would meaningfully change the work that we do, as opposed to much larger charities where you simply can't achieve that for that kind of expenditure. So there are a small number of charities like us in the wildlife area who have succeeded in breaking through to this donor base. And I think it's, uh, it's terrific that we're based you know, here in the, in the peninsula, in the Bay Area, because there are a lot of wealthy people. There's a lot of people who think deeply about issues, who care about the world, who are informed about issues. And it's got to be one of the best places for us to have a chance of succeeding in growing the organization. On the flip side of that, we are severely challenged in raising money just from the man in the street in America because we have no American presence. And that is not our wish, because America is the second biggest consumer of endangered animal products in the world after China. It's just that it was easier and more efficient to go after these Asian markets because of the nature of their media setup, which is more reminiscent of the US 40 years ago than it is now. That's part of the brilliance of, of, of this model, because you also are able to take advantage of a business reality. The business reality is that there are a lot of consumers for media, for content. But the supply in certain markets and the, the supply of quality media is not quite there. So there is a gap that, uh, by producing these very interesting uh, PSAs, public service announcements, by including celebrities, and by transmitting information in a, in a form that is entertaining as well as interesting and informative, you actually can place these spots at a very low cost and reach millions and millions of consumers every day with these messages. So that over time, they can absorb it, res respond to those messages, but it's not costing you a huge amount. You know, while I'd like to think that the network executives at these TV stations out in Asia are sympathetic to our cause, the reason why they put us up at 8 o'clock on a Saturday night is because it's what their people want to see. As you say, the demand for quality programming has outstripped the supply in those countries, and so we can say, we'll give it to you for free if you show it for free. Now, in America, that's gone because of the fragmentation of the media industry. Um, you know, everything you see on American TV is either programming or advertising. Right. And yes, there is the ad council who produces a few things um, like that uh, occasionally very effectively. But you don't have the situation that you had back in the 60s and 70s where 
a third or a half of the people in the country are watching one particular program at home after dinner on a weekend. And indeed, one of the greatest successful PSAs in the whole environmental movement, which uh, viewers who are over, I guess, 35 will remember, was one of an American Indian paddling a canoe up a polluted river past a polluting smokestack and put, parking it on a polluted beach and just looking at all of this disgusting you know, destruction of the environment and a tear rolls down his cheek. The real message of that ad and the brilliance of it was that it made people think I should not litter. I'd be getting driven to soccer practice by my mom and the guy in front would throw a bag of McDonald's out the window because he was done with it of his car while I was driving by. And within a couple years after that campaign, that never happened anymore. And now, A, you never see it, but if you talk to you know, an, an American kid right now and, and asked him if he could imagine somebody just chucking garbage out the window of the car while it's driving down the road, he, he couldn't, and we've moved on. And that's where a lot of these societies where we're working are right now. And indeed, we have been asked by some of the governments that we're working with to expand what we're doing from the endangered species stuff into environmental stuff, because they recognize that the easiest way to get people to do the right thing is to educate them, make something trendy, and therefore make another form of behavior uncool. Yeah, you know, what you find when you're talking about what we're doing is that people don't have a wide realization of the issues that are out there, and particularly some of the subtleties, like you know, why anything in the ocean has a difficult time getting onto the CITES endangered species list, even though it is endangered, and what would happen if they, if they went away. Another thing, talking about people's perceptions, just so we make sure to cover it, is that it's been astonishing to me to find out actually what happens and actually what people feel in countries like China. Because when people do get riled up about Japanese whaling or the Chinese eating shark fin soup, there is almost a straightforward step to the fact that they're, they're bad people doing something knowingly and they don't care what the right thinking yeah, people. Kind of xenophobia meets valid concern and all of a sudden. Yeah, and, you know, the, 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 oh, those bloody people. Right. You know, and the reality is, that especially with the young ones, if you lay out the facts, a lot of them sit there and think, God, I never knew that. Thank you for telling me. That's a terribly easy thing. to. I don't need to, to, to do that. And in fact, my parents should be doing it, and I'm going to go tell them not to do it. And in fact, the U.S. itself is not great no. at <laughs> behaving. I mean, the U.S., as I say, we're the second biggest consumers of endangered animal it's like products. like us lecturing other people about pollution when we're not necessarily doing enough ourselves. It's, it's just very interesting. How do you motivate people like that? How do you keep them together if you don't have the pot at the end of the rainbow that you might have at a, at a, at a, at a new venture that you're uh, funding? As far as motivating the guys to want to be doing this with their life, that, that hasn't been required in this case. And I think if it, if it did become required or you saw that somebody's maybe heart they're wasn't not the right leaders yeah anymore. I mean that, then that's a problem and and then you have a very interesting issue going back to the differences between venture capital and and charity as a VC when you've invested money and a lot of people don't think about it this way but you know we do it's not my money it's my investors money and I'm required to try and generate the best returns for them if a CEO's heart isn't in it or he's ineffective and stuff like that then you know, you, together with the other investors and the board, and hopefully you've got a good chairman and everything like that, and you go through the process, but they might need to go. And I've had to take a lot of those sorts of hard decisions in my venture career. You know, if there was a, an impasse between me and the founders, I would think to myself, well, I need to go. You know, it, it, I don't have a mandate to go and, and change that. I can try and help, I'm, but I'm there to support them and to empower them and to give them perspective. You are actually in dialogue with each other, with you bringing new ideas to them, they, they bringing uh, ideas to you, and you move forward, but you move forward in conversation with one another as opposed to a directed kind of, kind of an environment. And that's, that would seem to be a very interesting distinction and it re requires a, a very sophisticated style on your part as a, 
um, as a chair of a board. One of the most interesting aspects of, of being the chairman of a board is strengthening and motivating and harnessing the board that you've got and the board that you want to have. If you've got a charity which has a, a goal which is as compelling as ours and as people as talented as ours, in reality, the role of the board is to perform certain governance issues which are you know, tedious but necessary and to fundraise and, and to promote. Fundraise. And so that, that's why, you know, as we bring new people onto the board, you know, I have to have a, a serious conversation with them about giving and getting. And, and, you know, if on top of that, they're going to, you know, come up with the brilliant idea, which hadn't occurred to Pete and Steve about what we ought to be doing, that's terrific. The reality is we've got a lot of things that we know we could do in addition to what we're doing. The governance issue is, is an interesting one because in addition to the giving and getting bit, you've actually got to discharge your duties. You've got to attend board meetings. You've got to read the financials and understand them and accept that, you know, if we made a terrible mess of the thing, you know, then everybody's accountable for that. And that means there are certain people who are fantastic supporters of Wild Aid who shouldn't be on the board. We set up something called the California Committee, which is for younger, energetic people based in California, and we may replicate this on the East Coast and elsewhere, who love what we're doing, but they can't you know, give what I would ask of a new director, or they're not inclined to read financial statements because they're in the artistic community or something like that, but they're, they're a hell of a good supporter. And we've actually recruited over 30 people onto the California Committee in under a year who are tremendous supporters of ours. And now when we talk about doing a fundraiser, we go out to them and say, what do you think we should do? Where should we do it? How big should it be? And then you guys have to populate it. I think that that is something based on my limited experience, which a lot of small charities might think about doing. Because you, know, you can only change a board so fast, and you, know, you do want to wait for the very right people to come on. I mean, we're setting our sights incredibly high. I can't talk about who we're hoping to recruit onto our board, but one of the things I did in my first year was so expanded the size of the board from 12 to 18 with a view to creating space so that we didn't have to you know, rotate people off the board as fast as we could attract new people. And so we're right in the process of doing that right now and we've got some very interesting people you know, looking at coming on board. And is the next uh, part of the journey the prep for, the, for scaling the organization, for taking it from $2 million with a uh, $100 million additional footprint to $4 million with a much larger um, footprint? Is that, is that the next journey? Yeah. yeah, we're not looking to maintain. I mean, right. we, we want to grow, and I tend to have big ambitions, because you know, that's why you get into venture capital, is because you're optimistic and you want to you know, help things grow. And so, you know, as I would say it in shorthand, and you know, we'll, we'll see where we go, I'd love to take this thing from two million to six million over the next three years. And I don't see any reason why we can't do that. I don't think we need to become a monolithically large organization. I mean, we do what we do, and we're the best in the world at it. But we could do much more, and we could do it better, certainly by scaling to that effect. And you know, the end game, is, is interesting. If, if, if we're asked by you know, seriously influential people to move into other areas like the environment, and if you look at uh, you know, the environmental debate here in the States, you know, most of the fuss is about carbon and, and global warming, which of course is a terribly important issue, which I embrace. But you go to some of the other places in the world and they're like, yeah, yeah, that, there's that. But I mean, we've got good old fashioned soot and air pollution and water pollution and a contaminated food system and the people are rioting because of this. And you know, part of that can only be corrected through policy changes, but part of that can be corrected by influencing individual behavior through education and, and you know, changing things as we've been discussing. So there's a number of areas where the organization could go, but you know, in the end of the day, if it became apparent that we should be part of a larger organization, there's no impediment to going there. If we should stay independent, there's no impediment to going there. If you know, the thing goes on to live for 50 years and we need to bring in new, uh, new talent, you know, we could do that too. And so it's, it's nice to have that clean slate and to just be thinking about getting the job done 
it's also a powerful motivator to encourage us to work with other charities. The rewards across the charitable sector are not financial. They're about impact, but they're also about credit, and in certain of the scientific areas, about publication and things like that. You often find people who don't play well together, you know, which is kind of surprising, because from outside the charitable world, you think all these wonderful people who have you know, dedicated their lives to achieving good stuff. You know, they must all share a group hug. And yet the reality is that it's the worst thing in the world for 30 different groups to be doing the same thing on a subscale. Yes. If you want to get a job done, if you want to save a species, or if you want to eradicate a disease, or whatever it is, you know, if, if you look at it dispassionately, there's a most effective way to get there, and it usually involves a greater degree of collaboration than we typically see. And so I'm, I'm all for fostering that. Well, thank you so much for sharing the background on, on wild aid and the transformations that, that you're driving through the organization. Uh, it is a magnificent model, and a lot of people can learn uh, from it beyond the conservation uh, field. And, um, and thank you so much for sharing your insights, Doug.